Good Sunday morning to everyone. This is the Meek Street Church of Christ, and we're here coming to you this Sunday. This is January the 24th, and we have one more Sunday to go. There's five Sundays this month, and we're glad that there are that many Sundays. We talk about God's Word more in the month of January. No, February usually is a shorter month, and we have less preaching usually than we have in the month of January. But we're glad to be here, and we'll hopefully... We'll talk about some things that will encourage you and will help you in your daily life as a child of God and will help you to grow as a Christian should grow and desire growth every day as we come before the Word of God and we come before actually God's presence and in His Word for us as we understand God speaking to us through His Word. and We want to listen to what God has to say in His Word. I have some things I want to share with you today. A lesson that's really talking about why we do the things that we do. We're going to look and, and see about motives today in a lesson that will be helping us to understand why, again, why we do the things that we do. I'm entitled, What's My Motive? And we're going to look all through this lesson and look at, and look and see specifically what is the motive that people done the things that they did or why they particular practice was done and why even they thought the things that they thought in the scriptures. And really this could be a very exhaustive study. We're not going to go through everything, but I encourage you to think about the Bible from this perspective, why the people of the Bible did what they did, either good or bad. What was their motives for what they're trying to do? As we define what the word motive is, and Webster gives a pretty good definition of something such as a need or desire that causes a person to act. And that's really what moves us to do the things, motivates us to do what we do. And he gives an example of this. And Webster says the revenge was the murderer's motive. If you watched a lot of these crime shows like CSI and forensic files and things like that, you see oftentimes people have motives for what they do. There's always a reason, either it's trying to get the life insurance or it's revenge or it, there's simply a hatred. And sometimes that happens a lot of times. People do a lot of things. They steal and they lie and they cheat for different reasons. There's always a motive for sin involved in our lives. Also, there's also a motive for the good things we do. We're going to look at that as well in the lesson of the hour, but not all bad motives. I hope that our life is not filled with bad motives, but with good motives. The things that motivate us ought to be what God wants and expects of us. Again, that's why people are given over to a life of crime, because the motive is the desire for money and the things that money can bring us. That's really the sad part about that is people sometimes give themselves over to a life because of that. But I want to talk about even... The, just in general, the motives of life. You think about motive covers every issue of life. You know, it's the reason we do the things that we do, good and bad, like finding a job. You know, you go look out the wanted papers, you go to unemployment office. Why are you there? Because you want a job. The motivation is to have money provide for your family and such. Going to work every day. Sometimes the motivation, like the man once said on the bumper sticker, I owe, I owe, I'm off to work, I go. And so that, again, that shows us a motivation. Sometimes we wonder why we're there at work, especially on those bad days. And when maybe with outside work, when the weather's inclement and, and it's bad weather and, or maybe bad days in the office, that can happen as well when people are so grumpy and, and irritable, disgruntled. And yet going to work can be difficult, especially like say Monday morning can be that very way. Or going to school for kids. That's one of those things that kids sometimes lose motivation. But so why are we doing this? Why do we go to school every day during the week of school, Monday through Friday? Well, that's we have to remind them that's something they have to deal with and realize it's for their best good, their interest. Sometimes children don't see the motivation or they're not motivated to really do well in school. But they should because it's for their uh, future. It's for their benefit they do that. And actors and acting in a part, even they will say, what's my motive when it comes to a part or a, simply a scene in a movie and such? So it's all over. The issues of life is 
What is my motivation? Like we said, it's why criminals are in criminal behavior in the first place because they want something, they desire something. And we'll look at the scriptures though at several key people who did certain things and what was the motivation for those things. First of all, we'll look in, in Genesis chapter four, verses three through eight with Cain. You know, the two brothers, Cain and Abel. And the Bible tells us in chapter four, the first two brothers that it talks about here, and begin with verse three, it says, So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And so you see the tension between these two brothers because one was accepted by God and the other was rejected as one who was not bringing what should have been brought in the offering to God. And, and so that's why you see the problem here. In verse seven, God's, uh, verse six tells us, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? In other words, this idea of countenance, why, you can see that on people's faces sometimes. When they get angry, it shows, doesn't it? And here, Cain got angry with this brother, and it shows. God is noticing the fact that he doesn't have a pleasant countenance. His face is not what it ought to be as someone who's happy and, and joyful, but yet he's lost all his, his uh, goodness in the sense of his countenance. And the Bible tells us God saw that. He asked him, why is your countenance fallen? Verse 7 says, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And so God's warning came that if you don't master this, you don't get this anger and this problem taken care of, it's going to lead to other things. Sin lies at the door, in other words, because of this very way that you're doing it's all because of his actions. His actions were not right. God rejected his, his offering because of that. And yet, if he had done well and could change that, you know, that's, again, going back to repentance. Cain just simply need to get with the program, you might say, and do what's right, and everything will be just fine. But he didn't do that. And the Bible tells us in verse 8, Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And that shows us again the first murder. It's the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, the first a lot of, in a lot of areas of, of our life today. And we see the first murder that takes place. And what motivated this was either revenge and his hatred for his brother and his really rejection by God, all that ha plays a part in what happened there in that field that Cain took his brother's life. And you notice on the chart, I have these lines you can fill in. I actually have handouts for this lesson that you can, if you were here at the building with us, you could just fill these out as you go. And I decided to do a lesson kind of like this one. And when we think about though, what is taking place here? It's two brothers ought to have love for one another but yet because of a disagreement and an animosity, the Bible tells us why it's so important that we don't hate anyone because hatred can lead to other sins. And it did here when it comes to Cain and Abel, Cain slew his brother, he killed his brother. And the Bible tells us that was the very case. He killed him. And so what motivated him? Jealousy, anger, uh, hatred for his brother, a lot of those things a lot of sinful things that the devil tempts us to do on a regular basis. That's why we have to be very careful that our motivations are good, not evil toward our fellow man. And then we find the people in Genesis chapter 11. And this is one of those times after the flood, God wanted the people to be fruitful, multiply. He wanted them to scatter out and not stay in just one place. But that's not what the people of the land of Shinar did. They stayed together, and they were unified, and they were going to do something uh, regardless of what God felt about this, and God intervenes in this same chapter, chapter 11. 
Verse two says, it came about as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They used bricks, brick for stone, and they used tag or tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Let us make for ourselves a name. Notice that they wanted to make a name for themselves. Let's make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad, abroad over the face of the whole earth. And that shows us again what their motivation was for staying together. And God said, don't do that. Go out and be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. But yet they didn't do that. And so that was a motivation for them. They want to make a name for themselves. And that's sad when people are selfish in that regard. They want to do things their way and make recognition for themselves when exactly when that's not the thing they should do. As we understand, humility plays a part in our life as a child of God. And it, it will avoid a lot of sins, especially here where God came down later and confused their language and give them different types of languages. And we see the birth, we not say, of different cultures, and they have different languages now that are not the same. So they're not unified. God scatters that. And the Tower Project, you might say, was abandoned. The Tower of Babel was abandoned because of that. And it was a good thing. God did not want them to stay together and to do that and be unified in wrong purposes. We find Noah in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Here the Bible talks about how Noah was moved. The Bible tells us in verse 7, by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with fear, the Bible tells us. Moved with fear. That was his motivation. Prepared an ark for the saving of his household. That was also his motivation. Why did he do the things he do in building that giant ark that God said to build? How long, how tall, and wide it was. And it took years of his life to do. You may think about Noah and his motivation, getting up every day with his sons and say, well, let's get started on building this ark today. You know, it took, like some say, well, up to 100 to 120 years to build the ark. Well, whatever the case was, however long it took, it took a great investment of their time. And Noah did this, he was motivated. Every day he says, well, this ark is going to save our lives from this coming flood of water on the face of the earth. And that's exactly what it did. As Noah has saved his family, he was moved by faith in God and what God said was the truth of what he would do in bringing in that, that flood of waters. And we turn to Hebrews chapter 11, and this is one of the great faith chapters, the chapter that talks about what faith is. It defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But yet it's also more. It talks about the people of faith and how they acted and reacted to the things around them and what God said to do. And did they do what God said to do without really questioning and, and so a lot of skepticism and things like that? No, people of faith like Abraham, who was not a skeptic, but he was a man who when God said to do something, he was willing. What motivated him? In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, the Bible says, Read down to verse 10, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. And verse 10 gives us his motivation. It says, For he was looking for the city, which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And so he saw something beyond this life. It's something that God promised. You now, again, the promises of God mean everything to a child of God and also to Abraham. God, who cannot lie, promised to Abraham that I'll make your descendants as the sands of the sea and the stars in the sky, but I also will give you a place, a place of your own, not just a land promise. But, you know, he's talking about be with God in heaven as a wonderful city, that place that you and I look forward to go to that place that is prepared for us for a prepared people. So his motivation, it should be what our motivation is. 
is to do the same as Abraham, as we are descendants of Abraham, when we are people of faith. We understand that God has promises and we need to inherit those promises by faith, just like Abraham did. As we move on in our lesson, we think about Moses also in chapter 11, verse 24 beginning. The Bible tells us here about Moses' story in brief. He says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, why did he do that? Well, he understand he was part, you might say, he was originally an Israelite. It was always an Israelite, I should say. Uh, it was not Egyptian. He was as really as adopted side of that. So he refused to be called the adoptive side of his life, but yet he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He gave up a lot in doing so. He could have been rich and lived in luxury by simply staying in the palace of Egypt, but that was not what Moses wanted to do. What motivated him to leave all that? Well, the Bible says in verse 25, he chose choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. I like the old King James, the passing pleasures of sin or sin for a season. You understand he didn't, he didn't enjoy these pleasures anymore. When he went off and made his stand with the Israelites, that meant he lost that former life. He said goodbye to that former life, and he never looked back to that simply going back and say, well, I'm sorry, and, and I want to be a part of the Egyptian way again. That didn't happen for, for Moses. And so he said goodbye to that, and he endured ill treatment. In other words, he suffered. He suffered because of his stand there. And in verse 26 tells us again, what is Moses' motivation for making this life-altering decision that he made? In verse 26, it says, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. That's why he was able to endure all that he endured as a slave, you might say, someone who was not well regarded in, is in Egypt, but yet he took a stand there, just like all of us have to take a stand and the world's going to treat us differently once we do that. We're not going to have a good standing with the world when we say goodbye to the world. You know, when Moses left the house of Egypt, there was a time of disgrace for him. He was not longer considered one of the royal family anymore. So that he gave up a lot, didn't he, to, to do what he did. But he saw the motivation was the greater riches than all the land of Egypt could ever give him. He's going to heaven and, and to serving Christ. And he, he served Christ in some regard, even in the Old Testament. He understood the, the riches of Christ as being more important to him. Let me come to the New Testament in John chapter 12. And we find here a man who did not have good motivations. In John chapter 12, take your Bibles and turn over there. And we're going to see for the first time people who are doing the wrong things, like Judas was actually one of the disciples of Jesus. Jesus handpicked his disciples, but he knew one of those would betray him. As the devil, you might say, gained control of him through his greed, and he was actually uh, was willing uh, partner with the devil in some regard because of this. Now in chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible tells us that Jesus was in the house of Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead, and, and verse Two tells us they made him a supper there. Martha was serving, but Lazarus, one of those, was reclining at the table. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and uh, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. We just read this story not too long ago in a couple of lessons I did back. And here, those first four, though, here's the angle I want to bring in. It's here Judas's reaction to this, what motivated him. And sometimes, the Bible gives us by inspiration what the thinking, what the mind was. It's, the motive wasn't clear. Joe Judas may have looked to have all pure motives here by saying what he said, but yet the scriptures tell us a different story about his motives. In verse 4, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? In verse 6, now he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he, and he, 
And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. And so it gives us really the mind and the motive of Judas. Judas did not have good motives. He wanted to steal what was in the money box. And here he lost an opportunity because this could have been sold and could have put the proceeds in the money box. And there Judas would get his hands on that money. And it's sad, isn't it, that Judas had that heart. He, he gave himself over to that idea of, of stealing. And we do that willingly, don't we? The devil doesn't make us do anything, but yet we can be co-conspirators, you might say, by giving in, saying yes to his temptations. By all that, he actually helped the plan of God as someone had to betray Jesus and he would go on the cross and die for our sins. We see also the Jewish rulers in that same chapter, chapter 12, verse 42 and 43. And here the Bible says, nevertheless, many even of the rulers, it's not the rulers of the Jews, even some of the, even many of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they'd be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. They love, like the old King James, they love the praises of men more than the praises of God. They wanted people to, to look at them favorably but yet if they took a stand with Jesus, they would lose that favor with in the eyes of people. We have to understand we cannot be in the people-pleasing business. And so the motivation there was to simply have good standing with others and, and have that favor with the Jews, the Pharisees especially, because they would put them out of the synagogue and they'd have to suffer. And they wanted to avoid that at all costs. And the Jewish leaders in Matthew 27, it talks about their motive why they brought Jesus to Pilate in the first place. In verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For they knew that they had handed, for he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. And there's where the Bible tells us it was envy of Jesus that took him to the cross. Again, all of this was the plan of God. God use this in this way. And you might say they were not, you might say, had lost their free will. They had free will in this. God chose to, to do it this way. And he chose them to be the ones who would, would say crucify him, crucify him in that regard. And so he knew that they would do that. That's basically the point, isn't it? He simply, his son came at a time when the Jewish leaders were corrupt and they, they simply didn't recognize Jesus as they should have. And it may have been another time that they would have recognized Jesus, but yet they did not. And we understand it's all because of the plan of God. God's plan was fulfilled just like it was supposed to be, as the prophets predicted. Now we come to our practical side of our lesson today. What should our motives be? We've looked at motives from several people in the Old and New Testaments. Well, I'm going to talk about, first of all, about going to services. You know, the Bible teaches us that we go to services, and there's times, when, especially before this pandemic, that we were free to do this, and that we had no hindrance, that nothing stopped us from going to services. And I want to think about what's proper, what's our motivation? And here, Hebrews chapter 10, 22 to 25, is our motivation, isn't it? Verse 22 says, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Here it tells us the drawing near part is why we go to service. We want to be where Christ, where God is. We want to be there to serve him and to have because of our clean heart and our bodies sprinkled with or washed with pure water, all of that helps us to be recognized as the people of God and that people are there for the very purposes of worship. Now that we're cleaned up, we're able to go and worship as God wants us to do. And in verse 23, let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. The Bible tells us don't waver in, in your coming to services and, and your really your commitment, your devotion is really what he's talking about. You know, we can be sometimes wishy-washy or, or simply not be what we should be as far as our commitment. You know, if someone has a commitment problem, 
it shows in when they're there, when they're not there, to services and things like that. And in verse 24, he says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. In other words, don't think about just yourselves, but what you can do for others, how you can be there for them and, and help them to be zealous for God. That's what stimulating the love and good deeds is all about. We do that with one another. That helps us to be what we need to be. Verse 25 says, not forsaking our own assembling together, as of the habit of some, but consider one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. He's talking about why we draw near because there's a day that's drawing near. And that ought to be motivation because one day we'll stand before God in the judgment day. And at every service, every worship time that we were together there, it will all make sense why we were there and we were not absent because there's a day drawing near which we will give an account to God. And so why are we here today, this first day of the week? Well, we come together for specific purposes. We come together to help one another. It's not simply to what I can get out of it, but simply what we can put in and help and, and encourage and strengthen others in the faith of God. It's, it's for our mutual edification. It's for our benefit in that way. It's not to simply show off the latest fashions, and sometimes people do at Easter time. They'll wear these Easter clothes, and they'll wear their best on specific days. It's not to socialize. We don't come together just to be together and talk about things that's happening in our lives. That may be incidental and part of what we do before services. And I, I really like to talk about the, what's going on in people's lives that I worship with and get to know people that way. But that's not what it's all about. It's not about going to a place to find a, a, if you're a young person, a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's a place to worship God as we come together as the people of God. And that's our motivation is what I genuinely am here to serve God. And that's first and foremost. And I'm also here for my brethren to help them to serve God as God wants us to do. What about our motivations for doing good works? Sometimes politicians always have motives, and even sometimes business tycoons will give checks and, and make donations. They'll give them the key of the city sometimes, or these they'll let them do certain things that show, make a big show of giving something. Well, that's exactly what we should not do. We should be sometimes anonymously give. And I actually have more for those people who do that than the ones who want to make a big show and, and tell you about everything they've done for everything. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And so good works are part of our life. And that's what we should do. That's the business of children of God are doing good works. And yet, do we go out and blow the trumpet? before others. And the Bible speaks about that in Matthew chapter 6. Take your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 6. And here in the book of Matthew, Jesus wants us to know some things about the wrong way to do things. You know, his Sermon on the Mount says a lot about what was doing, what people were doing the time that Jesus was there as far as the good works and religion and things like that. But here he warns them not to do the wrong things. In verse 1 it says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. And we don't do this, the things that we do in service to God, just to be seen by men. Otherwise, Jesus says, you have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that, you, that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I'm going to say, that's one of the things that our motivation should not be to get the pat on the back and everybody to look up to us and say, boy, that, that person's so generous and they're doing all these works. And, and it is not, you know, motivation is everything. 
And God knows even we can do the right things, but for the wrong reason. Our motivation be wrong because we want to be recognized. We want people to see what we're doing. And, and our motivation, it should not be that way, Jesus says. We don't do the things we do just to be seen, but simply to do God, God's work his way and leave everything else alone. Just simply be a humble servant of the word of God and do all we can in that regard. But also our prayer life. He mentions also in chapter five, uh, chapter six, verses five through eight, he says, when you pray, you are to not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, that they may be seen by men. Notice there's a theme. Jesus is basically telling us, don't do things to be seen by men. And the Bible goes on to say, Jesus says, truly I say to have their reward in full. Twice he says that, doesn't he? But, we, but you, when you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And so the Bible tells us we're to do that. And it goes on to verse 7. When you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. So let's suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So don't want it's not all the, the dressing of prayer. It's not all the many words. Sometimes you hear, especially at gospel meetings and church services, people that want to do long prayers just here. And I'm not questioning their motivation. It's between them and God. But I do want to say this. If our motivation is simply to try to be so eloquent in our prayers that people will fawn over our prayers, it's all oh, just a good job that you did in that prayer then that is the wrong motivation. Jesus says, don't be like that. Simply do the work of a prayer. He actually gives an example of a, of a prayer to his disciples afterward, and notice how brief it is. It's right to the point. That's really what I try to do with my prayers, simply is be brief and to the point and do what God says in our prayers and not try to make a show out of everything that we do. What are our motivations when it comes to our preaching? as Paul would tell young Timothy about preaching, and that we ought to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctor, or the New American Standard, great patience and instruction. Notice verse three says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. He gives some bad motives here, doesn't he? He gives us bad motives about what people do because he says why they're going to do the things they do because they want their ears tickled. They want to hear what they want to hear. And it's not sound doctrine. It's not the kind of doctrine that would be helpful to them. And it will something it will benefit them, but simply feel good type of sermons. They, they will say, well, just preach it, brother, but don't do anything that says we have to repent of our sins or don't do anything that steps on people's toes if they need to repent. And so that's the kind of teaching we are to avoid. And there's motives for that because we want to be right with God. He says in verse four, these motives will lead them away from God. He says, they will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to miss. In other words, they're no longer preaching God's word. They're, they're simply preaching something else. That's what apostasy does. It takes, it takes us farther and farther away from the truth. But notice verse five, he says, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship. Do the work and evangelists fulfill your ministry. And so as you do the right thing, Paul, you do exactly, young, young Timothy said that too. And you, Timothy, you stay with the word and you, you preach it even when they want it, even when they don't want it. And your motive is only trying to do the work, the work of God when you do that. It's not trying to please men, not trying to, to help people to feel better about their lives if they're in sin. Let's help them to get out of sin. And sometimes people will get mad at the preacher because he's preaching all lessons that, that are saying, I've got to change. I've got to do something different than what I'm doing because I'm on the broad road and I need to get off that broad road. The only preaching that's helpful is when you help people to see the need for their salvation. Paul actually mentioned, I actually thought about using this particular verse or these verses in Philippians chapter 1, 12 to 18, 
Here he talks about some who are preaching for wrong motives. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for greater progress in the gospel. You know, Paul was in prison. He's not free to preach like he wants to preach, but yet it's all help for the furtherance of the gospel. And that's Paul's motive. You see very clearly his only motive is trying to help people. Verse 13, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. In other words, it's helped some to be more bold, and that's helpful. Paul's motive was good, wasn't it? And in verse 15, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. Some, are, some have motives, good and bad, for doing what they do. The latter do it out of love, verse 16 tells us, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives. And I want to emphasize that. That's where the Bible says about motives. What are my motives in preaching the gospel? Is it to feather my cap as a preacher? Is it to make me look good in the eyes of the people who the preacher are preachers and, and stand out head and shoulders above other preachers? If I do that because of pride, then I should not be preaching in the first place. But notice what Paul says, though, about this. He says about some, even though they have the wrong motivations, even though they're doing these things out of selfish ambition and envy, preaching from envy. He says about these kind of people that are thinking that cause me to stress in my imprisonment. So what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And this, in this, I rejoice. So Paul's happy that, that Christ is being preached, whether the people have the wrong motives in preaching him for not, at least the message is getting out. That's really what Paul is concerned about. And so that's what we should be concerned about. Is the truth of the gospel helping people to be stronger, helping be edified, helping them, helping them understand the truth of his word? That's the only thing that I care about. I can care less about if I get the pat on the back and say, well, you did a good job. And so those kind of things, sometimes preachers are more interested. Preachers sometimes can be more interested in, in looking good in the eyes of the people rather than the eyes of God. And that's our main concern. Our motive should always be, am I pleasing God in what I'm doing? Go back to Galatians 1, verse 10. Look that verse up and you'll see what Paul says about that particular thing. What about our evangelism? Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter in the book of Jude. But in verse 21, the Bible says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life, and have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. We do evangelism at the church here at Meek Street. Our goal is not to see how many people we can get in this building. It's not trying to get uh, all the people here to have numbers and simply brag about these numbers. No, that's, that's not the right motives, is it? Salvation of people's souls. That's the most important thing, saving people. Whether they come to this church or another church doesn't matter. As long as they're being saved, as long as they are listening to Christ, and I would like to have uh, 100, 200, 300 people here. Because sometimes we think, well, that may never happen. But yet yeah, our purpose, though, is to get people, though, saved, to populate heaven is the real goal of evangelism. And it's not trying to feather a preacher's cap, but so well, look how many, how many, how many people come because we have a, a brother so and so, a, a certain kind of preacher here. Now, our goal in evangelism is the salvation of souls. And I wish everyone would listen to the gospel and be a part of the work of God, as God wants us to grow, and numerically, but also spiritually. That's the most important thing: is that we grow as we should. What about our giving? Is our giving done in the right motives? In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, the Bible speaks about our motives there, how we need to have the right kind of motive. See, now it says, now I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. 
Each one must do just as he's purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of, under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. God says don't do it out of motive, thinking, well, I have to do this. You know, sometimes people get in the added habit of, well, I've done this. They put a check mark beside what we've done. And so, well, I've give, I've took the Lord's Supper, I've, I've listened to that preacher preach, and I've sung songs today. Well, I've worshiped God. Now, we should not do that with that attitude, should we? Our attitude ought to be one of cheerfulness, of joy, and thankfulness. As we talked about our lesson last week about what we should bring when we come to the services of God and to the church building, what we should bring in our worship. We need to bring a humble heart, a loving heart, a thankful heart, a joyful heart. But also that's, that's all we do that because we want to serve and worship God in everything that we do. And we should always have good motives for what we do. We conclude our lesson. The third and final point. Notice the fact that God sees and knows what we do. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. The Bible speaks about there, says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and, and, and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. In other words, God knows our heart. He knows when we're doing the best and from the right and pure motives. But he also knows when someone's doing something with wrong motives, just like Judas. We're going back to the idea of Judas, and he knew exactly why Judas, he may have thought, well, other people may have thought, well, Judas, that's very noble of you. But God knew differently that Judas did not have a good heart when it comes to his motives and what he was trying to do. And the Bible says in verse 13, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. In other words, God is going to judge us one day. He'll judge the thoughts and intents of our heart. He knows what we're thinking. That's why we can't escape judgment. And we understand we must guard our hearts against wrong and impure motives in everything that we do. And also to have a good influence on others. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Paul speaks about there how that he was there with the brethren there, and he had good motives. I want you to take your Bibles and turn over there, if you will. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. That's a long reading. But one thing about this reading is it helps us to know the heart of Paul and where he was there with these brethren on a continual basis. In verse 1, he says, For yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and mis mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our, in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by the way of deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. This passage is actually the most important we'll talk about today because we see here why Paul did the things he did among the brethren. They, are, they can clearly see that Paul is saying, this is the way I was. Remember the way that I was when I was with you. And sometimes people can see the lives of us, and we can have a good influence because of that very thing. He says in, in verse, verse 5 says, For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from men, either from you or from your others, or from others. Even though as, as apostles of Christ we have, might have asserted our authority. He's going to say, we were like a father to you. like You were like children to us. We had a heart of compassion. We did all that we did because of the furtherance of the gospel. We wanted you to, to obey the gospel and to be saved. And that was Paul's pure motivation for doing what he did. If we're ever going to have a good influence on others, we have to have pure motivations for everything that we do. And finally, to go to heaven. Going back to the example of Noah in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, where the Bible says that Noah was moved with fear, godly fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his household. In some ways, 
we follow that example, don't we? By being moved with godly fear, we prepare not an ark today, but we prepare what needs to be prepared in salvation, preparing ourselves for eternity by obeying the gospel, by living for Jesus, by worshiping him and doing what the Bible says about service. And that includes everything that we do. I want to conclude this lesson with 1 Timothy 4, 13 through 16. Here where Paul says to young Timothy again, until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance and with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. And this the temptation might be, well, everybody's seeing me, how I'm progressing, and how that, that they see me as being someone who's, who's getting great in the sense of the eyes of the people. No, don't be, don't be full of pride when it comes to that. Simply let your progress be evident to all as a young person. No, don't despise your youth, in other words, young Timothy. Verse 16 really tells us why he told his young Timothy to do all those things he just said in verses 13 to 15. Notice that he sums up by saying, pay a close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation, both for yourself and for those who hear you. That's really the bottom line for anything that we do. While we study the Bible, while we come together for Bible studies and listening to preaching, and while we are trying to progress in the faith and growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I know young people sometimes may not see the motivation. Why do we have to go to church every Sunday? It's because we want to ensure salvation for us and the people around us and help others get to heaven when this life is over. Hope you've enjoyed this lesson today and I hope it's benefited you in some way. Not just simply enjoyable, but simply it will benefit us when we do the things that God wants us to do. Until next time, have a good day and, and God be with you as we study his word each and every day.